I'm not going to <laughs> just, uh, just keep on going. Is that, you did reportage style? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's 4 <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and I'm good. And that's, that's what you really need to know about us. All right, let's get going. So, why collect vintage spirits? I, I do collect vintage spirits. It's not the cheapest hobby. My wife uh, isn't the biggest fan of that hobby. Um, but why Why wouldn't you do it? Do we have any vintage spirits collectors in the room? Bobby? Back there. How, how many bottles would you say you have? Uh, I have eight. I run a vintage Amari program for my restaurant. We have about eight bottles on at the moment. Right. And with Amari, do you, do you ever find when you open them, you sometimes get skunked bottles or oxidation? Um, definitely there's a variance in quality. Right. Uh, so most of them, I would say, are pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, you do have some that are a little less palatable than you like. Yeah. But that kind of comes with the territory of Amara sometimes. Yeah. Well, we're, we're not going to talk about Amara, so we are going to talk about some other spirits. We're going to talk about gin through the course of this. Uh, but why, why collect vintage spirits? Um, so there's a few reasons. It can be either part of a personal collection. Uh, I have roughly 400 bottles in my house. Again, like I said, my wife isn't a big fan of that. Uh, brand archives. So why why would a brand archive collect bottles? And how many bottles do you have in your collection, Joe? <laughs> We've got about 10,000 uh, in our collection. Um, that date from the 1880s up to whatever we're producing today. Is this your personal collection? <laughs> I wish that was my personal collection. No, so this is the Diageo Archive um, bottle collection. Um, so yeah, 10,000 of those bottles. Uh, some people here have actually been to see the collection Bobby's been, so um, yeah, it's a pretty special room where we keep them all. But the reason that we keep them is, well, one, it's great to see how the packs evolved over the years. So if we're redesigning a bottle, it's always nice to go back and see what was on it before and maybe you can bring some of those heritage cues through into the new pack. We've done that most recently on things like the new Mortlith releases. They have nods back to the past on the pack. Um, and I mean, to be honest, it's just really special to stand in a room and see all these bottles around you and know that this is the legacy that you're continuing today. We don't drink ours, so that's the only difference. You and drinks his. <laughs> yeah. And now we, sharing it. We can yeah, we can't drink ours, we're not allowed to open them, so they're they are they are there for display. Yeah, uh, much, much to the archive team's chagrin, I, I will send them pictures of the empty <coughs> bottles once we've done seminars with people and they're like that should actually be with us right now. Not, <laughs> not in people's stomachs. Uh, but that's what they were made for. That's exactly what they were made for. Yeah, no, they were made for drinking. So I tell a lie, sometimes we do analyze some of the spirit as well so that we can chart the evolution of the blend or the spirit over the, the decades. So we do sometimes take little samples out of them, but not, not to drink. Yeah, uh, and the archives, we have about 8 million items in our archives. We have the largest spirit archive and ball collection in the world. Because we're a boutique startup. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, you can be a fan of a brand, so sometimes you will get people who will only collect Macallan, or they will only collect Chartreuse, or they'll only co collect like ports and things like that, and they will come fairly obsessive. It's almost like collecting all the Pokemon. They want to have every single one. <laughs> Pokemon's still a thing. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it's like yeah, it's back into being a thing again. Ah, that's fairly depressing. Yeah. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> But that's what they will focus on. So they will be fairly singular and they will hunt out all of these rare bottles from that specific brand. And, and it's more just a thing of completion more than anything. They typically do not drink them either. It's just there to be on display. And they, they don't sell them either. So once they've got them, that's them. They hoard them away. The other people are those uh, liquid investment brokers or people who collect them and then store them away in warehousing. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in the, in the next slide, about why people do that. Why would you invest in spirits as opposed to equities or bonds or things like that? And then finally me, uh, to drink. So that, that's why we're all here. We're here to taste vintage spirits. We're here to analyze what they do. We're going to talk about the, the OBE or the old bottle effect. What happens once something goes into a bottle? Does it change or does it just stay exactly as it was when it went into glass? But talking about our, our investment chums, 
This is based off of Scotch data. This, this comes from Rare Whiskey 101. They do an annual report as well, and they will compare it to previous fiscal years so you can see how things track. And you can see our friends from Edrington, Mount McAllen up at the top. Um, I'm not mad at that. My, my cousin is the Stillman at McAllen, so it's very nice. You can see it from my, my parents' house as well. Um, and then you can see Pomore Distillery there. Pomore Distillery is actually slightly skewed because it's only one specific bottling that throws that number up, and that's Black Pomore. Has anyone ever tasted Black Pomore? No? I have. I drank a bottle of it, and who gave me that one night? Uh, it was very nice. Responsibly. Yeah, responsible. With, with the Asio people. Uh, and then you can see Ardbeg there, number three. Ardbeg, very, very collectible. And then Portellan from oh, very good. Thanks from Isla. I lived in Isla for a little bit. Uh, Port Ellen, obviously very collectible. And then you can see Highland Park, my campus manager of Highland Park, uh, Langevolin, Lafroy, Glenfiddich, Springbank, and Balbenny. So if you are a Scotch collector and you're collecting purely for an investment reason, this is a wonderful resource to look at. What I would say is like any other investment, it does fluctuate. So Although McAllen is at the top there, it, it may be in two or three years' time that you know our bag might be at the top or Bamore might be second. So that's one thing. Keep an eye on the investments, see how they are tracking. There's various things that will affect them. You know, if you are reopening a distillery, for example, like we are with Port Ellen, then you know you will start to see a drop in that because people are saying, well, you're reopening it, it's not going to be as rare as it was. Although those original ball clings, the original liquids are obviously very rare, pre-1983 liquids. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do we have any investors in here, any liquid investors? Are we going to have any at the end of this session? <laughs> <laughs> I definitely I'll definitely sell you all of these. <laughs> Make my wife a little happier. It's definitely becoming more um, popular now, the investment side of things. We're seeing a big jump in that back in the UK mm. um, with people investing in, in Scotch in particular. Yeah. And it's almost like artwork. You know, people are investing in Scotch like we would do in artwork. And another thing is there's data available for Japanese whiskies, there's data for shochus, there's data for wines, all of these different things. Uh, one thing we are going to talk about is fakes throughout the course of this and how to watch out for fakes because they're prevalent. They're, they're everywhere. And as this category grows, Obviously, people see how much money can be made from it. Wine has always had a lot of forgeries, and if you've ever seen uh, Sarah Graves' documentary, you will know all about that. Uh, but in whiskey, it's becoming more and more. It, typically, it used to be the best fakes came from Italy. Yeah. Uh, now they're being produced all over the United States, UK. There was a large counterfeit ring busted in the UK very recently as well. So do watch out for that. We are going to show you some pointers of things to look for. Uh, but if you were to look at this, and this was a ranking of American whiskies, then there's some fairly obvious ones up there, like original Stitzel Well or Liquid, things like that are extremely collectible. Uh, Paddy Van Winkle, obviously, year on year on year, goes up the price, uh, although you can buy Weller. <laughs> <laughs> it's delicious. Uh, so we are going to start off with tankery. So if you if you take the covers off your tasting mat, so what I will ask you to do is take away number one and then put your mat back over. The reason for this is with vintage spirits you have accelerated oxidation. So once they come out they will oxidize way quicker than a modern liquid would do. So we are going to keep those covered up throughout the course of this. Certainly until we get a little deeper into it. Hey Sean, I think there's a seat somewhere. There, there you go. Um, so, you missed all the jokes, Kenyon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, so we are going to start off with that. This is 1960s distillate of Tanqueray from the London distillery. Uh, we have an image of it here. So what I'll say is do not finish this because we have two, two uses for this. One, we're going to try a small sip of it. And then we're going to bring out a, a Negroni base. So we're going to bring out some and sweet vermouth, and then we're going to make a 1960s Negroni a la minute. You can even use your little pinky finger to stir it in there, <laughs> a la Gary Regan's, or you can just give it a little swirl. But we are, we are going to taste it, but I'm going to let Joel talk a little bit about the original distillery, uh, or the distillery certainly that this was made at in London. 
So the distillery that this one came from is based in um, Clark and Well in London. Um, we chose this site predominantly because we've got good water there, which is key. You absolutely need that if you're going to be running a distillery. And also it's very easy to get um, botanicals into this place because it's quite near the docks in London and also you can get your spirit out. So again, that's just key for trees coming in and out. Um, you'll notice maybe on the picture it says Tankery Gordon and Co. So um, Alexander Gordon and Co and Charles Tankery and Co merged in 1898 to form the largest gin house in the world. Um, and world domination of gin began. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they moved, Tankery actually moved their production to this site um, in Goswell Road here. And actually the picture doesn't quite do it justice because they really owned that entire street. So they had offices and a distillery on one side and warehousing and bottling on the other. So it was a massive operation here in the centre of London. And this place was so synonymous with gin, you just called it the house. So where did you work? I work at the house. Pretty cool. <laughs> and this is a picture of inside that um, still house here. So again, this is actually from about 1960. The distillery itself was pretty much destroyed during the Blitz. Um, in London and then they rebuilt exactly where they were. So this is post uh, World War II and they reopened in 1957. And uh, this is the new shiny still house then. Um, actually a bit bigger than what we have now at Cameron Bridge where we make tankery today. Um, all the tankery in the world is made in Scotland. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Don't just make good whiskey, we make some good gin too. And um, there's only three stills at Cameron Bridge that make uh, all of the tankery, so it's you know it's very much a craft business, just craft at scale, as we like to say. The little uh, still that you can see on the bottom left, that's tiny ten. So if you drink tankery number ten, um, the citrus heart for tankery number ten is made in that still. So again, it's quite an old still, um, but not our oldest. Uh, that is Old Tom, which again, your tankery that you're drinking, uh, the 1960s one, and the tankery that you will drink today is all made in Old Tom and that still is about 250 years old. So going strong. Can we just tell them a little bit about what else Charles Tankery got up to? He didn't just make gin, did he? No, so Charles was quite um, an eccentric person. So he um, was a chemist. So we are delighted to have his recipe books at the archive and we use these a lot to inspire new Tankery products. So if you have enjoyed our Tankery Flor de Sevilla, a Malacca, um, Bloomsbury and Old Tom, these all come from the, the limited the, the recipe books that we have. Um, but as you look through these, you'll also see random things like boot polish recipes and recipes for <laughs> pills for your horse if it's got a sore stomach. Mm -hmm. So he was a bit <coughs> crazy. Definitely used that <laughs> chemist's mind to make more than just uh, alcohol products, but I love that about him. He was quite an eccentric. So let's all have a little taste of the like. So typically what we will do is in what we call sensory analysis in our industry is, is you'll do a few things. You'll look at colour. This is absolutely clear, so there's no point looking at the colour. Please just take a small sip of this. The other thing we do is we do nosing. What we'll do in our labs is we'll take alcohol down about 20% alcohol by volume because we'll be sometimes nosing hundreds of samples throughout the course of the day. Very rarely tasting them, you go mainly off of nose and you can go nose blind, so we take that ABV down so you can do multiple samples. And they'll just push the, the ones that they find exemplary to the back and then the others are left in the line. But they can go through them very, very quickly. Uh, we are not taking this ABV down. So what we are gonna be doing next is having a little nosing session. So there's two schools of thought on this. The first school of thought is that you see the little dot bang in the middle, you take this index finger and then you find the exact middle spot you shove your nose as far in there as possible and then do this whilst hoovering up all of the aromas. <laughs> Second school of thought is uh, that you keep a distance and then you keep your mouth open, slightly circulate air, walk from nostril to nostril, take it away, bring it back, do that multiple times and then you'll start to pull out the botanicals from this, in this case, or if it was a whiskey, the congeners. So the reason, there's one, well, two reasons why you want to do this first bit by doing this is one, you have a thing up your nose that's called your olfactory bulb, your olfactory epithelium. It's hardwired straight into your cerebral cortex. It's extremely powerful. It's a heart back to when we were lizards. I don't know if you believe in that or not, if you're right or wrong, <laughs> wrong if you don't. Anyway, so we were. Uh, but 
you are a very, very powerful brain and an extremely powerful nose. So what, trust your initial instincts with all nosing and write down your initial thoughts. We call those primary selectors. And then you can write down your second ones that we call them secondary. And then we have tertiary as well. And start off with basic building blocks that not only you will understand, but other people will understand. So if you're working on a panel, for example, and you're writing down there that it smells like ocelot musk on a summer morning somewhere in Umbria, then someone's gonna be able, what the fuck does that mean? That doesn't mean anything to me, but if you're writing down there that you get like a, a slightly musty character to it, then you're getting you know, all these different things, like a slight botanical nose to it, heavy juniper, prickly, spicy, character music like that. Or if it's in the case of like smoked whiskey, you would write smoke, it's that simple. And then from there you would write down vanilla, creamy, so on and so forth. So you have these indicators that you understand and then other people understand as well. So that, that's the nosing thing. Well, I'll, I'll tell you a small story before we get into the tasting bit is when I first moved over from, uh, from Scotland to the US nearly 10 years ago, I was doing a Women in Whiskey seminar in Washington DC, and in the, in the UK we call our noses our hooters, and uh, I said, <laughs> you see where this is going, I said to a room full of, of fairly esteemed, wonderful women, don't shove your hooters in your glass, <laughs> some people are whispering in here, that doesn't mean what you think it means. <laughs> Thankfully none of them did. Uh, <laughs> all right, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to have a small sip if you haven't done already. Uh, move it around your palate, like I say, circulate the air, draw it in over your tongue, and then breathe out through both nostrils once you've swallowed for as long as you can. It's called retronasal olfaction. It's a good way of circulating air so you gain more contact with the back of your palate and also like your nasal canal and through that olfactory bulb. So let's have a little taste. So we tasted a 70s one on Wednesday. Yeah. Um, that seemed a little more juniper forward than this one. I'm gonna taste. It's very soft. Um, so we, like I said, we tasted a 70s Tanqueray. Uh, this yeah. one, this one is much, much softer. Whereas the other one was very juniper forward, very, very spicy, even compared to the modern day London Drive. But this one, we have seen, we see what's called chemical degradation. Degradation, all chemicals die off. Everything dies off. I don't want to sound like a nihilist, but everything dies off. Um, and chemicals are no exception. And as they die off, they actually change flavor. Um, so we're starting to see a dip in juniper on this one. And there's yeah. more of that creaminess and slight citrusy quality in here now. It's the citrus. Yeah, yeah. I'm really getting the citrus from that. Citrus. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's very pleasant. Uh, the oxidation has, has softened that out, the old bottle effect has kind of rounded it off. So I wouldn't say this is like a perfect example of what they were creating at that point. But once it goes into glass, there's nothing you can do about it. It's just going to soften out. And that's the old bottle effect, which we'll talk about in a minute. So if we've all had a little sip of it, what we are going to do now is, is heresy. Do you want to take a picture of this and send it to a boss? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Let's take a picture of everybody doing it. And, uh, I am actually going to do that. <laughs> and, and she'll have an aneurysm. I'll get a promotion! <laughs> Alright, so everyone want to pick up their, their gin and then pour it into their Negroni. I want a, I want a big cheers from everybody. Cheers! 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 cheers. cheers. Here we go. Uh, Alright. <laughs> like I said, you can either just agitate, give a little Wait, stir missed. in there, like a little missed. lolly stick. Mm. Or you can go full Gary Regan and shove your finger in there, it's totally up to you. Um, here, I'll let you try it. Do you need a, a glass? Take it okay, no worries. Thank you. So there you nice. go. 1960s and Gronies, Breakfast of Champions. <laughs> Welcome to Tales. I should have said at the beginning of this, we're all about responsible drinking. At Diageo, you are going to be drinking high strength spirits throughout the course of this session. If you have water in front of you, please do hydrate. I know it's fairly early in the morning. You do not have to finish all the samples in front of you. In fact, you don't even have to drink any of the samples that are in front of you. Quite why you would be here if you weren't going to do that, but never mind. But please be mindful of that. And if you feel like you need assistance getting to where you need to go at the end of the session, 
that led someone at Mill, someone with a gray jacket and a beard, to standing next to a door. Uh, <laughs> he's, such a, he's such a nice human being. He'll get you where you need to go. Uh, all right, so did we like that? Yeah. It was tasty. It was very, very pleasant. I liked it a lot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Here we go. in that wall in the head space, or, or the ullage they call it, uh, you will have a lot of volatile aromas and ethanol vapor, and they rot cork over time. So that completely near rotted this cork out, but we didn't have any cork in the liquid at all, because our, our wonderful friend here is skilled at what he does and managed to get it all out with no cork droppage. But that's one thing, if you are opening old bottles, be extremely careful because of the fragility of the cork that you will have in there. If indeed it is a cork and it's not a spring cap enclosure, which we'll talk about in, in a moment. But let's just get into whiskey number two. Uh, like I say, this is a distilled 100 years ago from various distilleries around Scotland. Uh, some of the distilleries in here are closed, have been demolished, are no longer there. So you are really tasting history here. You're tasting things that will never be made again in the same way. And so some of the distilleries in here, which specific ones can we talk about? I'll put you on um, the spot. Yeah, you are, because I don't work for Walker. Okay. Um, <laughs> Cardu. Car yeah, well, Cardu is always in Walker. Um, they bought the license for Cardu to sell it in to Mexico, so they, they've owned it since then. Um, but then there's smoke so, was a bit with kind of the backbone of them as well. So we would see some West Coast influenced whiskies in here as well. Uh, poss possibly but Kalila. Kalila. I would, yeah, most likely Kalila would have gone into this as well to give it the smoke. Um, but I did taste this earlier on in the room next door because I was more worried about this whiskey than any of the others uh, because I've, I've tasted many old whiskies and sometimes with these old, old ones you can have that over oxidation and they will actually start to turn into acetone. If you ever smell acetone on the nose and you can't, you can't miss it, do not drink it. Whatever you do, it will make you extremely ill. Uh, this does not have it at all. It's got a very, very soft nose to it. And when I was talking about degradation of chemicals, phenol is what makes smoky whiskey smoky. Uh, it comes from the peat. They die off as well. So typically at about 30, 40 year mark, you'll start to see a noticeable dip in it. Obviously this has been in the bottle for a long, long time, nearly 100 years. So we're gonna see very little smoke in here. You will pick it out, but what we're gonna see is more of the more softer flavors, more delicate flavors. So let's all have a little sniff and a little taste of this. Cheers. Extremely pleased with how that liquid is held up. 
But it wouldn't have tasted like that when it went in. It would have been much smokier, more peppery, and those have all softened and all, all but died off. Early 30s. And the tangerine was 60. Yeah. It's, sometimes it's quite hard to be a bit more specific for that because the bottle hasn't changed that often. So. Yeah, you're just going based on labeling and. Uh, label closure, yeah. We'll talk a little bit about that actually yeah. later on how we date them, but don't let them die. Joe makes past the walk around as well. Just be careful because it's not going to yeah. lead. Yeah, there's no. Keep it up, yeah. right. <laughs> I don't drink out the bottle. Alright, spotting face. So as as you're all here, you should probably be wary of this. You know, there there be dragons out there because there are a lot of fakes out there. Things you should look for are, are dates. So do research on the distillery. Find out when it was active. If it's a single malt and it says in there 1941, for example, then you know that it's not a real whiskey because World War II, all distilling for the most part shut down in the United Kingdom. Uh, typos, we'll see a really wonderful example of a typo in the next slide. Uh, sometimes from the Far East or you know from South Africa, places like that, we will see really obvious typos in there, uh, things that just don't make sense. Uh, and we have a wonderful example of that. Incorrect tax strips, is specifically for uh, American whiskey, or more so for American whiskey and Canadian whiskey. And I'll show you how you can date those as well, because this is a really easy way of doing it. Smell. Uh, so if you bought what you think is a Lagavulin, and there's no smoke on the nose, <laughs> then you know, no Some, something's up here. Yeah. Probably bells. Uh, and, and then the price. If the price is too good to be true, it's Usually. a fake. <laughs> Every single time. Uh, it's just the way it is. So if someone says to you, you know, I've got an 1896 Macallan, I'm going to sell it to you for 500 bucks, just say, no thanks, I'm good. Uh, here, we, here we see a slide, I don't know if you can read this particularly well, but on the right hand side we have a counterfeit Johnny Walker, and then on the other side we actually have a real one. There's a typo there, they've misspelled distillers, uh, the code is printed in the wrong lo location. So find an original that you know is an original, and it's just a case of where's Wally, like swap the differences between the two. Buy a good magnifying glass or a jeweler's loop, one of the two, you will need them uh, because there's a lot of detail in there, specifically if you're looking at tax strips or UPC codes and things like that. Make sure you go over it. Don't buy anything on the internet without asking for a high resolution image of the front and the back and the top enclosure of the bottle as well. And make sure you go through it piece by piece by piece because some of the forgeries are very good some are not so good, and we're going to see a really good example of that in this next slide. So, spot the difference. <laughs> <laughs> this is from the Asia market. Also, is that real? That's real. Yeah, it's real. Yeah. It's real. There's a red labial as well. <laughs> so I'm sure you can get oil before. But, you know, they did, however, get the date right on it, 1820, so hats off for that one. They did, they did take uh, effects similarly of that, but Johnny Worker, Black Lady, old, old Scotch Christie, he spelled whiskey right, bonus point. And then my favourite bit, distilled, blended, and bolded in Scotland. So, uh, so yes. Yeah. Do they do it on purpose? Like, no. The copyright for the or like, what? No. And we get these all the time at the archive. I would say now, um, I'm getting one or two a week where I'm having wow. to try and verify on behalf of auction houses or buyers bottles that they've been sent that they want me to verify if they think it's authentic or not. It, it's a big, it is a big problem. And some of them are not as obvious as this. This one's hilarious. <laughs> but, um, you know, some of them are clever. This is like a lazy, like, portraiture, you know, like, you have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> you have no idea. They're everywhere. I've got a lovely bottle of Gordon's Panther Piss. <laughs> We're going to finish off the session with it. Uh, so yeah, please, please be careful. Yeah. Is a label on an old bottle that looks too nice, like too pristine, is that 
Not as a, that's a really good question, and not always, to be honest. So we bought a crate of actually we're going to try it not not from the crate, but some hate gold label um, that dates to. Uh, 1942 so just as they stopped to blend for the war we got a full crate of that and each bottle was individually wrapped in tissue and then in this straw basket and then sealed in the crate and it had not been opened so it was delivered to this guy's house still had the delivery slip 1942 at 3 p.m port street in sterling this guy got his delivery he must have put it in his loft and forgotten about it so his grandson brought it to the archive and we opened it every single bottle in that is pristine like it looks like it's just come off the shelf and i know it's authentic because we've got the provenance around it so it's not always an indication the other thing we have to be careful of now is that occasionally on auction sites people are selling label books which is a big problem because if you then as a forger buy a label book you can take the label out and put it on the bottle so it's you just have to be so careful yeah so do you think that uh it's hindsight some of these bakeries they actually put a cryptic message in it that it is they're not trying to just make a facsimile of it but you know like this one here it's obvious it was very funny but evidently it looks very bad or they're they're not bad yeah, honestly, I think it's just, and it depends on the market as well, especially things that are predominantly sold in the Asia market, they, they don't pay that much attention at all. No, because they're not going to They're not trying to be uh, clever or, you know, leave a trace of all oh, this is. I, I don't think so. No, I don't think we have any, like, like master villain Bond geniuses <laughs> out there who are, like, adding their little signature to it. No, they're just trying to make money. But the person who probably made this one on the right right hand side was probably knocking out another like 15 or 20 ripoffs that day, who's probably making slack Daniels after this. <laughs> 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 uh, so would you say that was from the 30s? The Johnny Walker you just tried from the 1930s, yeah. Okay. All right, so what to look out for? We have some good stuff in here. Fill height, sometimes you will get things. So if this is more for purchasing, if the fill height is really low, so like typically they would fill them to around about this mark, depending on the brand. If you see a fill height below the shoulder, don't drink it. It's it's a collector piece more than anything else because you have well, this area here's called ullage, your head space. If you have too much oxidation, it's going to be undrinkable. So look at your fill height very carefully. If it's a really, really old bottle and your fill height is like up here, it's it's a fake. Uh, the enclosure, like it depends on what kind of enclosure. Like we said, we had cork failure on, on two of these bottles from the 30s. That's very typical, so be careful of that. Or in the case of these, these are called spring caps. Has anyone seen these before? I'll pass them around. So very popular way of securing spirits. So all you did was take the foil off and then use your thumb and then pop it. And then they have this little lug here and then you just push that forward and then it would come off. So I'll pass that around and you can have a look at it. Uh, so look at the enclosure, if it's tight or if you can see there's like a, a visible tear in the foil, things like that, just be mindful of that. Again, go over it with your, your jewelers loop or your uh, magnifying glass condition of the cork is kind of based on the same thing. Also smell it. Uh, so you get like if you smell like a funky character coming off of the cork, then that's not a good sign. Uh, but if it might just smell old and quite quite dusty, there's there's nothing too wrong with that. But if you get an off character, you'll smell it straight away. Uh, Melanie's streaking, what I mean by that is specifically with these spray caps, sometimes the glue that was used in them they, they use the different types of glue. Some of the glue is really, really good, and others reacted with the ethanol. If you see streaking down the inside of the bottle, again, it's a collector bottle. Do not drink it because it's actually toxic. Uh, so be wary of that. And then condition of the label. So there's a few things that can come into play here. Does it look too pristine to be good? If it does, check with someone who knows what they're talking about. You can take a picture of it and actually send it to an archive team at a brand and they will validate it for you. Don't go and buy it straight off of the, the fact that it looks great. Make sure, do your research, because sometimes you're paying many, many thousands yeah. for a bottle. 
Uh, if you see old chipped labels, like this one here, uh, what happens with old labels is you won't see any glue residue under here or really, really old bottles. If you see like glue here, then they've stuck it on and it's a fake. So be wary of that too. And then we get into tax strips. This is more so for North America, but we will see them for like foreign markets also. Yeah, and you can date them. Uh, so this came from, if you go to Drinks Planet, they have a wonderful database. They have a really good resources where I took this one from. And you can see the triple ones and the one one twos, and you can date those specifically between some years. So we also have 1934 to 44, pre-war and into World War II. And then we have post-World War II ones with the triple ones. And then after that, we have 61 to 97. So you, you can kind of work out a gap of when they were produced. If they're bald and bond, we'll talk about that in a minute, they were very helpful because they will show bottling and distillation date on those strips. But this is a, a wonderful resource for them. The wonderful, nice people in Canada put dates on them, which was very helpful. So we're <laughs> gonna taste one of those in a moment from 1963. But you can see some other examples of it. Here's a Canadian one down at the bottom. And you can see these are both from 66 and 97. But then you have other ones like Kentucky tax strips from the 40s and the 30s and things like that now. And there's a wealth of information online about these things as well. So Drinks Planet is a good one, but there's Whiskey ID. There's, there's a bunch of resources out there that you, you can go on and look at. And they will show you counterfeit ones as well, because believe it or not, there's counterfeit tax strips out there too. Yeah. And if you aren't finding what you need online, please do get in touch with the archive team for the brand that you're you're wanting to buy. Because like Ewan says, it's a lot of money that these are sometimes being sold for. And don't be afraid to ask for provenance either. So if you are buying from an auction house or if you're buying from a, a, somebody independent, ask them for the provenance of the bottle. You know, they should be able to provide that if they can. Yeah. And that's another good indication. So we're now going to taste whiskey number three, which is a 1963 Crown Royal uh, from up north, produced in Gimli, Manitoba. This was still back when it was Seagram's Crown Royal, owned by Samuel Bronfman. Samuel Bronfman uh, made his fortune pre-war, during the Prohibition era, by producing a lot of Canadian whiskey. That was not for the domestic market, so you can probably guess where it was going during Prohibition. Uh, across the lake, it's straight into the hands of someone who died of syphilis. <laughs> uh, right, this is a, I actually picked this up, uh, well, a colleague of mine picked this up from a restaurant in Washington, D.C. that had it as a display bottle. We asked them if they would swap it. We had another nice bottle that they wanted. So this was a straight swap. This is how we acquired this one. We pick our bottles from all, all places. This one came from a restaurant. Most of these actually came from a broker that we use in London, a guy called Edgar Harden, uh, who we use extensively, and he's very good at value. Which restaurant do you see? Rare, Steakhouse, yeah. And they actually have a vintage bottle collection in there. So if you go in there, you can order Old Hagues, they have a bunch of old Hagues. Do you do swaps with Jack Rose? I do swaps with Bill, who owns Jack Rose, and Harvey, the buyer from Jack Yeah, yeah, I'm very good friends with them. They have an incredible collection. You know what I mean? Jack Rose in Washington, D.C., it's, it's something else. Anyway, let's have a look at this. So this one's held up really, really well. Um, this just tastes like crab oil. Uh, they perfected that recipe in the 40s, actually the late 30s, for the, the King and Queen of England who were coming over on a Canadian trip. So Bronfman created enough crime oil for that trip, he created the brand for that trip, that's why it's got the crime on it. It came in the purple bag because it was going on a ship, uh, taking over on a ship over the lake, and then it was put onto a railway car, and then the royal trip went around Canada on a, on a train, and when they came off it, I think they only had one crate, 27 crates of crab oil left, so they obviously had a wonderful time up in Canada. <laughs> Poutine and crab oil. <laughs> um, but it's held up really well. Screw cap on this one, really gray, really creamy. Uh, and I know I'm a big fan of crab oil. I think it's a wonderful whiskey. It's very well balanced. 
It's a delicious whiskey. I like the creaminess of it, and that's really what they're going for in that specific style. Did we like it? Yeah. Really yeah. nice, that food. Uh, OBE, Old Bottle Effect. I talked about this a little bit earlier on. Some things that you have to look out for. One being what we call glassy. So glassy character, you can smell straight away. It has a slight chemical nose to it. So it's not acetone, it has almost a floral character to it. It's like, it doesn't smell like whiskey. It has a slight off character. You know just by nosing it, it's gonna taste glassy. So it'll have a slight chemical flavor to it. And uh, do watch out for that. Oxidation, we spoke about earlier on. If you get that really funky nose as soon as you pop it open, you know there's over oxidation. If there's, if there's a low fill out in your bottle, you are gonna have oxidation. It just happens every single time, so be wary of that. But if you have a decent fill height and you have a solid enclosure in there, you're going to be fine for the most part. Phenol degradation, this is more so with scotch. Uh, you're going to see, like, like we tasted with the red label, it would have been a very smoky whiskey in its day. When we tasted it, there was very little smoke in there. So that is how it's changed in the bottle throughout the course of its life cycle. A drop in ABV. If you have some kind of enclosure failure or, or cork rot, things like that, you can have a substantial drop in ABV. So most of these went in at 40 or for ABV or 80 proof. And if you're sometimes down in the 20s or something like that, it's going to taste watery, it's going to taste off, and also the oxidation is going to increase. It's, going to, it's not going to taste great. And then the worst of the worst is acetone. If you have an acetone turn in your liquid, do not drink it. Whatever you do, you will smell it straight away. It smells like nail polish, like a heavy nail polish character, a slight pineapple-y character to it as well. Please do not drink it. You'll be extremely sick. Uh, we, we bumped into people before who have just been, oh no, it was really expensive, so I drank it anyway and ended up in hospital. It's very serious, so do not do it, whatever you do. I think I've been quite clear about that. So, so, drink you do it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Someone picked up on my subtle subtext. Uh, Alright, so let's taste our next whiskey, which is number four. This is White Horse. Uh, White Horse was a huge brand here in the United States after World War II, before World War II, and through the 50s and 60s and the 70s. Uh, enormous. And then J&B actually took over as, as one of the largest Scotch blends of its time after that. The, this is a very unique whiskey because it contains some very rare, rare whiskey in here. It also has Lagavulin in it as well because this happy-go-lucky chap here, Sir Peter Mackey, owned the brand and he also owned Lagavulin Distillery as well. Um, he was somewhat of a tyrant, uh, part megalomaniac, part genius, part eccentric, his business partner called him. Uh, but he was fanatical about quality and fanatical about consistency. And this was his baby when he created a blend. He wanted to make it a smoke forward blend that had Lagavulin in, in it. It also contained, we think, another whiskey called Malt Mill that was produced at Lagavulin Distillery. Has anyone heard of Malt Mill? Bobby, that's a surprise. Uh, very rare whiskey. There is only one bottle of it in existence, and it's new made spirit. It's at the Lagavulin Distillery. It's, it's classed as priceless liquid. They never released malt milk as a single malt. It all went into blends, and, and this was one of the blends that was, that was going into. So very rare, very old whiskeys that were going in here, made by this lunatic here. Uh, he was he was such a interesting character that he fell out with his old business partner who ran the Lafroy Distillery at that point. If you've ever been to Isla Lagavulin and Lafroy are right next to each other. He actually diverted their water source so they didn't have any water. <laughs> he stole their master distiller and put them into malt mill and, and created a distillery within Lagavulin to replicate the Lafroy style. It didn't work out particularly well, so it, it all got blended out. So yeah, don't don't fuck with him. <laughs> uh, here we see a letter. This is an interesting letter. I don't know if you can read it particularly well, but it, it's it's from Peter Mackey, and he's talking about Hazelburn Distillery. 
and how he wanted to have a style from there that was, was replicated or, or was a facsimile of a Glen Livet or North, North County style, which was Speyside at that point before it had been called Speyside, it was part of the Highland region. And he was basically saying, I want to order this hazel bar because that way I don't have to purchase all this really expensive Speyside whiskey so I can put that into my blend. So he understood the flavor components and how he could then take whiskeys from other distilleries and still create his consistent, delicious blend. Here is the spring cap. I think I already passed one of these around. Here's a little white horse spring cap. White horse was the first whiskey brand in the world to actually have screw caps as well. Uh, and here is one of the old lags, old lags labels. So we're talking about dating bottles, but we are going to taste another old whiskey. And this is a single malt this time. This is number five. Everyone try number four. Did, did you tell us when this white horse was made? This is late 60s. Pass this one around. This is, this is a bit of a bigger bottle. Yes, it's a handle. Whilst that's getting passed around, you let's have a little bit about Oban. It is pronounced Oban, America, not Oban. 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 Yeah, Oban, like open your mouth. Oban your mouth. So Oban is our oldest facility. Um, it was established in 1794. And um, it was originally a um, um, brewery. So they were making a thing called Cowbell Ale here for two years. And then they decided to convert the distillery into a malt distillery. So it kind of fucks the trend in Scotland because um, at this time predominantly people were uh, running illicit stills and nobody was trying to do the right thing apart from these poor guys at Oban who were wanting to make a, a, licit, a, a true illicit whiskey rather than illicit. Um, and it's probably one of the, well it's one of our smaller distilleries. It was originally marketed with uh, small still whiskies, and um, it's beautiful so it sits here um, surrounded by the cliffs on one side and the sea on the other. So the distillery will never grow. It can't get any bigger because it's right in the centre of the town. And in actual fact, the town of Oban grew up around the distillery. So the distillery came first and then the town came later. So that's priorities for you in Scotland right there. Um, and also, you if you go up to the top of this street here, there's a really good Chinese restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> Fun fact. Fun fact. You are obsessed with this Chinese restaurant. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's, it's an absolutely gorgeous facility. Um, as I said, one of our smallest ones. Um, because of the way that it's uh, configured, they've got parts of the distillery operation in the roof because they can't fit it all in one space. <coughs> so it's quite a quirky little distillery to walk around. And actually, I think now only seven operators work there. So it's a very small team of people making all your delicious <coughs> open. Uh, yeah, the cake's folly up the back there, yeah. Yeah. Um, That's the thing on the hill. So yeah. the, the liquid here is from the 1970s. Uh, this is when it was still a 12 year old, it's now currently a 14 year old. That's the start standard line for Oban Distillery. Um, uh, and it's wonderful, I tasted a little bit of it earlier on. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Oban anyway. We actually did a special releases these thing a few days back and we had the open 21 year old special release of cast strength which is incredible we don't have it here sorry but we do have this uh, this bottle is affectionately known as the bath salts bottle because of its shape yeah bath salts have a bad rap in florida yeah well for different reasons sometimes you get hungry people uh, eat bath salts So you and Google are Florida. why why the jump from twelve to fourteen as far as for the aging process to for Oban? I mean I don't know to be perfectly honest. Uh, we've got Oban being historically sold at eight, twelve and fourteen. It depends. It would have just been around the stock constraints and what they have more of. So they might have found that actually just giving it a couple of extra years in cask worked better, yeah. or for some reason they didn't need it for blend, so they, they pulled a little bit for 14 year old. But we don't always know the answers as to why. Yeah. Um, but it's a good way of dating them as well. Yeah. Like Talisker went 8, 12, yeah. uh, yeah. 10. 
And then we know about that many again as part of the special release. But you, you can date them through that yeah, yeah. as well. And the bottle shape change was just they wanted to do something more streamlined or it was like Yeah, that was uh, yeah, that was really yeah. expensive. I mean I think we still actually use that to sell president whiskey in for oh, that yeah. but then um yeah, the change to the sort of more standard like that shape now that you've yeah. got over that would have been a cost. Cost, yeah. Right, yeah. Cool. But once they moved from the, the late 70s into the 80s, the carton then appeared. So again, you can check online and date things fairly well just by things like that, like small things like packaging. And then there are things to look out for. Um, so we're going to move into this. So here are some things you can do to help date things out. So if you're looking at very, very old bottles with, with the hand-blown ones that don't, didn't come from a mold, if they have bubbles in them, then you're looking at things from the 1880s or before. Glass seams, so the three-piece mold, as it's called, appeared in the 1890s, and that's when you will start to see the seam coming off the outside. Uh, tag strips, we spoke about earlier on, probably the most famous is the triple one and the one one twos for dating things out. Uh, distillery name, owners, and address do do this, so go back and check and see if those match up because sometimes distilleries move, owners have obviously changed throughout the life cycle of the distillery and addresses of the headquarters will change as well. So make sure you match those up with historical records to see if they do make sense because if they don't, it's a fake. Uh, this is more so for Canadian or for uh, UK bottlings. You will see what's called the Royal Warrant on them. If it, it's got the Queen or Her Majesty the Queen Royal Warrant on it, then you know it's 1953 onwards. Prior to that, you will see the King on there, or some of the bottles even have the recently deceased King written on them too. Wow. You can have a good way of dating your bottles through from there. Barcodes appeared in the 1980s, so if someone's trying to sell you a bottle selling you it's from the 70s and it's got a barcode on it, it's not. Uh, and trust us, that happens a lot. Uh, age statements, we just spoke about. Age statements for brands will change throughout the course of history. So sometimes like we're talking about Talisker went from eight to 12, 10. You can date things pretty well based on what those age statements look like. Other things you can look at, more so with scotch, if you're buying or looking at scotch that's been matured in sherry, then you will start to see sherry element or sediment down at the bottom of them. If it's completely clean and clear or even quite golden in color, it's not sherry and it's a fake. Uh, good ways of dating things, if you are gonna buy something and it's extraordinarily expensive, you can actually ask them to take a, a, a needle draw from it and you can send that sample to get radiocarbon dated. They actually do it with carbon-14, which degrades over time at a very consistent pace, so we can carbon date liquid. So if you're buying something from the 1800s, you can get that done, and they will tell you when, when it was made. Uh, carbon-14 is a very interesting thing. It was affected by gamma rays from space. If you want to Google that, it's fascinating stuff. Gamma rays from space also, uh, if you ever listen to podcasts, you can go on Radio Lab. They talk about gamma rays and what they do. Uh, they can actually do a thing called bit flipping, where they change at zero to one in the computer system. Of course, it's playing like crash with that. Anyway, that's another thing. <laughs> <laughs> Nuclear reactor nearly went into meltdown as well. Uh, and then we have here GHC. This is gas headspace chromatography. Same thing. If you're if you're not convinced about the validity of something, you can actually send it away to a lab. They're everywhere, you can have it done in the United States, you can bring one in Germany that we use as well, and they will match that against the template so you can say, look, here's what the liquid should look like. If this is a Johnny Walker Black from the 1930s, here's what that template looks like. They will match it up, and if it doesn't match, 
to fade. And they don't need much uh, liquid to do this either. It's like a two mil sample that they need to take to be able to do any of these tests. Yeah. Uh, bottle and bond strips. So they, they are very helpful. They have an awful lot of information on them. Uh, if it has a size on it, like a half a pint or something like that, then they're pre-73s. Uh, if they do not, then they are post-73. Uh, lithographic versus modern prints. So back in the 1800s, there were mainly, mainly lithographic prints. You can spot them, they're very, very high quality. Then once they moved into modern printing, if you go under and look at them through a uh, magnifying glass, you will start to see the pixelation dots appear in there where you wouldn't see them before. And then, this is more so for the United States, pre-1980, you guys switched from metric versus imperial. If you're seeing old imperial ones, it's before 1980, so January the 1st, 1980, the TTV put that in force, so you guys changed over to mil, so you were in the 750s and so on and so forth. A good way of paying things out. And then your emboss here, the, the federal law emboss, was running from 35 to 64. But please do not reuse or resale. You'll see that on the back and the neck portion of the bottle. That's another good way of dating things out. UPC codes. Uh, the first five digits of the UPC you can pay back to a brand or a company. Double check that because sometimes forgers get the wrong UPC codes on there. So if they're trying to tell you that it's a Heaven Hill modeling and you put in the UPC number and it comes up and it says that it's Crown Royal, you know that it's a fake. And then on the bottom of the bottle, what we call the punt of the bottle, you will see sometimes two digits that will tell you when the glass bottle was produced. If that doesn't match up with the labeling or when they say the provenance of the bottle comes from, it's a fake. <laughs> Uh, and our final whiskey, this is another 1930s whiskey. This is from the uh, Hague Company, uh, the Hague Brothers, Hague and Hague. This is gold label. Uh, we, we picked this one up. I haven't actually tasted this one, so I don't know what it tastes like. I haven't noticed it yet either. So this is a bit of a voyage of discovery for all of us at the same time. This is, I think, actually 1941, if I'm right. Yeah, it's got an appointment to the late King George IV. Right. With, uh, well, we're not in. I don't know the dates of my kids and queens. I think it's 41. I think it's 41. Yeah. Sure. I don't always trust those friends. <laughs> 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 I think it's pencil. Uh, regardless, let's all have a little taste of our final yeah, whiskey. That was good. Cool. Distillery, the old Cameron Bridge Distillery, which was the site of the first patent still continuous distillation in Scotland. For the, the whiskey boom that came on from the phylloxera infestation in France. In the 1850s, some English botanists brought some cuttings over from the United States of vines. Unbeknownst to them, they were full of the phylloxera aid and phylloxera bug that then ravaged the south coast of England. All the wine was wiped out. It then moved into France and decimated the wine crops of France. So cognacs and so on and so forth, wines were no longer available and the upper echelons of society couldn't have their brandy sodas, so they looked for something else and it was scotch. So they were having their scotch and sodas and it exploded. That's where the scotch boom really started. And to this day, uh, scotch and sells cognac well one in France. Thank you very much. Uh, but. They needed more whiskey, so they needed to do continuous distillation rather than just pot still distillation for their blends. And so they were really the pioneers of, of that methodology. But that's really good. It's nice. It's delicious. So and then I think we're going to finish almost on time. Do we have any final questions before we wrap up? Did you all enjoy it? Yes. yes. Yeah. I have a question. Is that one person to clap? Did you all enjoy it? Yes. Uh, to hold. What are the conditions that would be best for that? 
a new mix spirit. So yeah. that wouldn't be a whiskey, that would just be classed as new mix spirit. So unless it's being matured in a warehouse in Scotland for three years in one day, it would not be whiskey. In after, let's way. say you were purchasing you know, after that aging period and it's bottled, uh -huh. you wanted to hold on to it. What conditions would be best for, for that? Um, just to make sure it's stored in the right way, so make right. sure the temperature's okay, you're not sh storing it anywhere humid, um, and there's no direct sunlight on it. Yeah. That would be the, the only thing. So when we are storing our bottles, the temperature, the humidity, and the UV is all monitored in the rooms just to prevent further degradation. Yeah. Yeah, direct sunlight is probably your worst enemy. And in fact, I used to work for Suntory years ago, and we found an old Mooter bottle from Gomorrah from the 1850s. Uh, I got to sample it and then a guy in Russia bought it and put it in a shop window in direct sunlight. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh. Oh. Yeah. So right. the, the relative humidity and the uh, temperature are what, 68, 55 degrees? So long as it's not so warm, so I, I would say 60s is, is good. If you're starting to get like 70s and beyond, <laughs> over time, if you can start to get accelerated, caught the cork rot. So keeping it in a cold, dry place, perfect thing. Uh, cold, dry, uh, no humidity, because you'll get label rot as well. And again, yeah. no the right light. Yeah, the cigar is similar to that. It can keep them very stable. Yeah, yeah. Cool so I think our room um, is normally kept at about 18 degrees Celsius. I don't know what that is.